Hey everybody, good to see you guys again. I mean, I can't see you, but you can see me. And it's the last time you're going to have to. Actually, this is one other video. Um, so that's a good thing. Because uh, we're all, you know, quarantined here together. And, oh, we're not quarantined together. That would be a oxymoron and with uh, COVID-19. So um, this is my last lesson for you guys. My last uh, time I'm going to be able to teach you guys anything. Not that you can say that I ever taught you anything, but uh, it's my last attempt to teach you guys anything. So, so at least my last attempt to teach Sam anything. Sam, wake up in the back there. He's sleeping again. I know it's because he's his head in the way. Anyway, um, that was always his excuse. I'm just saying. Um, this is the end of the year th project that I would normally do after the AP exam was over. Okay. And uh, I know none of you have to do it. None of you are probably going to do it. Um, but, I, and I probably wouldn't even have, you know, kind of what I'm, I'm graduating as well, as you know, I'm, I, I probably would have just said well enough alone, AP test is over two weeks, three weeks, you know, there's no point in even doing anything. However, the reason that my hair looks like this and my beard looks like this is the same reason you guys are all sitting in your basement in the same jammies or sweatpants you've been wearing for about four days. It's because of COVID-19. We're all self-isolating and, uh, you know, quarantine and sheltering in place. Um, so, you know, by the way, this beard is an absolute self-isolation magnet. You know, people see this when you're walking down the street and they automatically want, they want it to get four, six feet away from you, you know, when they were 60 feet away. They don't want to come any closer. So this is my, uh, I really don't need a mask. Nobody's going to come anywhere near me. Oh, I look like this, kind of like a wolf man. Or the Lorax. Oh, the Lorax. Oh, I never got to say Lorax. Who was it that didn't get to see Lorax? I forget. Was it Taylor? You got Taylor. Was it you? Taylor, are you listening? Anyway, um, maybe it was, was it Millie? No. Annalise, was it you that never saw the, heard me say the Lorax? Well, that could be a third video I'll add to do the Lorax, you know, at some point. But, um, because I know some of you were absent when I did that in, in Chem 1. Um, anyway, it's completely irrelevant. Back to the project. Uh, this year, at the end of the year, I would, I've been kind of, you know, throughout the year, I've been kind of telling you guys that I was going to do this. I was leading up to this with multiple videos I was showing you on EMFs. Remember that? DDT, um, breast implants. All of those were leading up to this project that you would be doing on your own, a paper that you'd have to explain, or you'd pick a topic and you'd be able to do what you think, all right? Um, you know, you, the two different uh, sides of a controversial issue and you'd tell me what you thought about it, all right? And you'd do the research on it. That was the original plan. Of course, now that we're here, obviously it's not gonna happen. Um, however, it can still happen if you wanted to do it. I, if I, and I'm still gonna show you this video and there's a good reason for that. But considering where we are right now, considering where we're actually, um, probably sitting in your rooms or your house, quarantined from everybody else, along with the rest of the country. This happens to be the most relevant of all times to, to do this paper. So although you may not do it, I'm still going to go over what I would ha want you to do if you were doing it. All right. And I'm going to go over all the um, requirements and the rules. And the, basically, uh, I want to kind of give you my perspective on what you should be looking for when you're inside one of these Scare stories. We've talked about a few of them before. You may remember some of the videos. I'll talk about those as we go on here. All right, but I'm going to start with uh, the basically the topics from past years. And if you look at my uh, 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 picture here, or actually this is this is from the notes that you would be getting. All right, it's popping up right now. Uh, There's a paper you're all going to get. I'm going to send this home to you, and it has all the um, themes concepts, suggested topics, and introduction talks about what, how many pages and all this other stuff, and some logical fallacies. I'll talk about that too. But if you look at those to uh, suggested topics, these are ones that I've had for years up there, okay? Something should pop out at you, right? See those that word viruses? A couple of them are on there, aren't they? All right, you see, you may see uh, Zika viruses on there. That was a big deal a couple of uh, years ago. Um, the West Nile virus quite a few years ago. So, it's not like this is the first time you've seen things like this, or at least that I've seen things like this. Maybe it is for you. Um, so I, really, this assignment has never been more relevant. And I guess it's kind of ironic <laughs> that the one year you really should be able to, should get some use out of this, uh, you're not going to probably do it because I can't make you do it and I can't create it. Still, I'm going to make this my last lesson for you in hopes that even if you never actually complete it, 
you'll at least know what to look for when you're in the middle of one of these honest-to-goodness scare stories. And I don't think anybody would argue that we're not in the middle of one right now. Now, whether it's justified or not, I'm not saying, okay? As many, many people believe, it is all the stuff we've done has been justified and we need to do more. And other people are saying the whole thing's overblown and it's a big hoax, okay? Well, obviously most people are in the middle of that. Uh, and I want you guys to look up the stuff about this and to find it out. Because normally I'd have you do your own uh, choice. But this year, obviously, I think most people would want to choose the one that we're in the middle of. Okay? So at the beginning of the year, as I say every year, I don't know what's going to happen this year, but I'll guarantee you before the year's over, and I'm always right, there's something that happens throughout the year that comes along and the media tells you you're going to die really soon. It may be SARS, West Nile virus, Ebola virus, global warming, terrorism, whatever it is, something I told you would happen throughout that year and your very existence would be threatened. Everything now is an existential threat to your, to your existence. But somehow you would manage to survive like you know we always do. However, I knew something would happen. I'm not predicting that it would have been the coronavirus, COVID-19, because in other years it was uh, terrorism or it was uh, SARS or it was some other threat that came up. But there was going to be something uh, that was going to happen. And you were, nope, it could have been the polar vortex, but something was going to happen to um, threaten your existence, to scare you uh, senseless. All right. And the thing is, in my life, I've seen a lot of this. Um, I've been told that the world was going to end in the next few minutes from a whole lot of different things. Like including uh, global cooling when I was a kid, global warming, pollution, depletion of natural resources, overpopulation, insufficient food production, pesticides, herbicides, ozone holes, deforestation, GMOs, antibiotic resistant bacteria, and any number of viruses like SARS, bird flu, swine flu, Zika virus, West Nile virus, Ebola virus, and of course the latest coronavirus, COVID-19. In fact, this latest scare isn't even over yet. And they're already touting the next boogeyman. You know who it is. You know what it is. That's right. Murder hornets. Seriously. Murder hornets. Could they come up with a better name than that? This is me now. And don't even get me started on the whole toilet paper thing. What are people thinking? Are they making masks out of it? I don't know. Anyway. Um, all these world, end of the world scenarios don't even include those lesser things that I was told to worry about, like trans fats and BPA and high cholesterol and low fiber and LR and apples and endocrine disruptors and diet sodas and caffeine and alcohol and gluten, secondhand smoke and whatever the latest unconfirmed study was that said it was going to, something's going to kill us. Well, at least we don't live in Australia where pretty much everything really is trying to kill you. Most everything. Anyway, um, you would think that at some point people would revolt against this, this scaremongering, these prophets of doom, but they never do. For some reason, people either ignore or forget the bad predictions once a new one comes along. I can give you at least a dozen more doomsday scenarios that have never come to pass. All right? But that's what's the point? People never learn. As soon as one scare story goes away, there's always another one on the horizon, and people buy it hook, line, and sinker all over again. In fact, sometimes these people are brazen enough that they're going to actually make the exact opposite prediction that they made just 10 minutes earlier. Well, usually not 10 minutes, but a few years earlier. Classic example, of course, is I've told you about this global warming when I was a kid. You know, it used to be called global cooling in the 70s. And then it was called global warming in the 90s. And now it's called climate change. So it encompasses everything. And it happens, could possibly, couldn't be wrong. You know, I read in the newspapers as a kid and scientific journals and magazines that, you know, even they were, they were basically for kids, were all telling you we're heading into the next ice age. I mean, this is all over. I could show you lots of video and uh, uh, pictorial evidence of this. Okay. It wasn't like this was just a few, you know, cranks out there that thought this. Everybody did. Um, as these very pre various predictions failed, uh, it went to global warming in the 90s. And then as they failed, they realized, because a lot of those predictions didn't come true. We're not, New York's not under 20 feet of water. A lot of this, there's not the last snows of Kilimanjaro, like I said. A lot of the predictions in Al Gore's, uh, um, you know, uh, what's, his, what's the name of the movie? Somebody, help me out here. Um, 
an inconvenient truth, right? Uh, a lot of those predictions that were made by that just didn't come true. So we changed it to climate change. That way, whatever happens, we can claim that we were right. If the temperatures go up, that's climate change. If they go down, that's climate change. If there are droughts and fires, climate change. Floods and storms, climate change. More snow, less snow, colder winters, warmer winters. It's all climate change. I love to have this job where everything that happens proves what I said was right. But I don't get it. And we all know that's not real science. So many times this has happened. I just use global, uh, you know, global warming as, an, as a classic example, but this is not the only one. I mean, growing up I was told that you know, margarine was better than butter until I learned that margarine contains trans fats and they're supposed to be worse than you, worse for you. I was told to eat lots of grains and cereals according to the food pyramid. But it turns out the food pyramid was wrong. It was upside down. We were told eating high fat diets made you fat, when in fact it's the sugar that made you fat. It wasn't the high fat. And low fat snacks are actually loaded with sugar, which is not only makes you fat, but it's kind of addicting. Studies on alcohol and caffeine, they're so contradictory that you can literally wait a week and you'll see one that will say one thing and something will say the next. I mean, they're a week apart. Where someone will say something good about a coffee or something bad about coffee. Something good about alcohol, something bad about alcohol. Remember in 9-11? 9-11, we were all afraid of terrorists. So no one was allowed to wear a mask. <laughs> yeah, that's right. No one was allowed to wear a mask. Now you can't go into a store without one. Okay? It's crazy. We are told if you wear a mask... It's too dangerous to be able to wear a mask. You know, you don't know their identity. People could die. Now we're told if you don't wear a mask, people are going to die. Remember when they banned plastic bags at stores, grocery stores? A lot of places, especially out in California, did. They banned plastic bags. Got to have your own bags because you're killing the environment if you're using plastic bags. And now we're realizing that, hmm, those same reusable bags, they're killing people because they're just little germ factories that contain viruses and bacteria and that don't go away and you don't wash them every day and every time you use them, that's worse than using plastic bags. So now people are leaving their groceries in their car untouched by human hands and handling the mail with gloves and not touching it for days all because of the chance of having COVID-19 on it. I just Everything's backwards. Everything You just wait five minutes and they will change their opinion on whatever the topic happens to be. Anyway... Turns out the reason for that is that fear is a great motivator. Unfortunately, it's not very conducive to making good decisions. When you're scared, you're not thinking right. You make bad choices, and sometimes there are severe consequences to those choices. So that's why, especially in times like these, it's important for me to do this lesson. And I'm going to do it, even though probably no one's going to watch it. I can see if anybody's watching it by looking at my YouTube channel. I'll probably have three views when I'm all done, but I'm still doing it. Despite the fact that I can't grade it, I'm going to share all this stuff with you. And basically for the reason, I want you to know what you really should and shouldn't be scared of. And if you can apply the stuff I'm going to tell you over the next few, well, maybe half hour or so that I'm going to talk to you over these couple of videos, if you can apply that to this situation, maybe you can learn what to be afraid of and what not to. Maybe you can look at it from a rational perspective. And I'll try to point those things out to you as we go along. Now, Normally, like I said, you'd be able to pick your own po topic, but this year, I think most of you would agree, the only topic that anybody would want to do something on, if you wanted to do it at all, would be on COVID-19. I'm sure you've all seen the debates online, and they are pretty uh, depressing to watch. I had not been using Facebook for literally years. I hadn't really been, just go, never even checked it, let alone post anything on it. Well, if you've been looking at your parents' Facebook accounts, or if you've been looking at the memes and the battles that are going on on the internet, you're realizing that the country is more divided over this. It's hard to believe that it's divided over a scientific issue, but they're more divided over this than they are over Democrats and Republicans. I mean, it is absolutely crazy. I mean, half the country thinks we should lock the entire place down for the next 18 months until the entire virus is either gone or we have a vaccine from it. And then other people say we should have opened it up and never done anything to hold things a hoax. I want you to see, you know, as you look over this stuff, to see if you can determine where you stand on this issue. And not just by parroting the talk of some meme you saw on Twitter or your parents' opinions on the subject. I want you to do the research the same way you would have done it for this paper in the past. So let me just tell you how I've assigned these papers in the past. I have done, um, yeah, well, you're going to get this first, and you're going to get other papers too. I'm just holding them up, but you're going to get them as an email in the future. Okay, uh, or you already have gotten them, and that's when I told you about watching this video. 
All right, so everything I'm giving you will be also emailed to you. So you don't have to worry about writing any of this down. Not that anybody's even going to do it anyway, but still. All right, so here's what the paper should look like. In the first part, you should discuss the, the science behind the issue. Okay, now the biology, the chemistry, the physics, whatever, the mathematics of it. All right, you want to discuss that. You do not um, want to give me any opinions in this part of the paper, the first third of this paper, if you were doing it, which I'm sure most of you won't be, but if you were, the first third of this would be on the science, the actual science behind the issue. So what is a virus? Okay, how does it operate? How does it work? Is it alive? How does it spread? Just the facts. You can include diagrams and pictures, which would often be helpful in this case, all right, in this part of the paper. So that section is about one third of the paper. I want you to spend, if you were doing this in for a grade, I would, I would be grading you on, did you cover the actual topic well? Did you actually, you know, explain the science behind it for about a third of the paper? The next part, oh, by the way, the paper should, have, I think it's like six to nine pages. So that means like two to three pages on that. Second, you should describe both sides of the argument. And trying to do that without bias is pretty tough. You want to give the other side's case, even though you may not agree with it right now, you want to give both sides of this issue fair treatment. It's very difficult to do. All right? It's very difficult to do for a lot of reasons. All right? Because most of you, it means listening to the other side of the argument, which you don't do. You just don't. All right? I've told you before in my class that I watch Fox News, MSNBC, CNN. I watch them all. And I purposely watch them all because I want to be able to defend what my position is. Okay? If I don't know what the other person is saying, then that's, it's a useless... I, I'm going to be, in any argument, at a disadvantage. Okay? All right, so you're, but the reason you guys don't know how to do this is really twofold. Okay? First, there's confirmation bias, which you're young and you don't really realize this a lot of times because most older people I know don't realize it. I'm sure I'm guilty of it at times too. Confirmation bias is where you only look for the evidence that supports your belief. Okay? But the second part, that reason you'll be bad at this, finding, uh, bo being able to describe both sides without bias, is that is because of the age you're living in, the technology age you're living in. All right, the vast majority of you guys get your news from basically tech companies like Google, Amazon, Twitter, Facebook, whatever. I don't know if TikTok does this because I don't think you can make a dance out of it. But um, all of those technology um, me mediums. Have, are simply tracking you. They know you better than your best friends. They are constantly scanning your internet footprint. And they're going to tailor any information they give to you. All right, Anything that you see coming up on your feeds in these uh, devices is going to be consistent with your prior notices, like your prior things that you were clicking on and you liked. So, guess what? You only get one side of an issue. I mean, that's fine if you were looking, you know, you see a lot of ads for uh, prom dresses because you were looking for a prom dress. That's actually useful. It's actually helpful. You know, oh, wow, I, I, I found uh, the right dress because of this crazy ad. It just happened to pop up when I was surfing the internet. And it's perfect. That's nice. But it's not so nice if you want to learn both sides of a controversial issue because you're only going to get one side of that issue. Okay? And, you know, you're, it, if you're just looking at your Twitter feed or Facebook... You're going to get whatever you happen to already think is correct jammed down your throat. All right, so it's going to be difficult for this first sec in this uh, second section, but I don't want you to just make a caricature of the other side. I don't want to make a straw man. And by the way, if you don't know what a straw man is, that's also in the fallacies part. You'll be able to see a little video on that and um, a paper I'm going to give you. Um, look for reputable sources on either side. And you say, well, there are no reputable sources on either side. You know, I'm a Democrat and think every Republican is an idiot. I'm a Republican and I think every Democrat's an idiot. There are. There are definitely reputable sources on both sides. Okay? And you can find them. Okay? It's easy to demonize uh, the weakest elements of anybody's argument. However, if you actually give me both sides of that argument, um, you're going to be prepared to actually defend your case better because you'll know what they're going to say. All right. Finally, the third part of the uh, paper, you're going to um, tell me where you fall on this issue. You're going to back up your conclusions with facts, figures, and um, all kinds of supporting evidence. And also why the other guy, the other side, has uh, is wrong. Not just why you think you're right, but why they, some of their, they've used logical fallacies or deceptive statistics. Okay? And you have to be specific here. 
I don't want you to just uh, say, well, I think this at the end, you know, because you, know, you have to be a very good reason for what you, what you think. And that's what I would be grading for it too. I would actually, usually I would say, I want to see at least one or two logical fallacies, uh, some st the statistical uh, deception, you know, something that you found when you were doing your research. And, and, and obviously that's not hard to find on the internet. I mean, all you got to do is look at any media website on two sides of an issue. You take the liberal and the conservative side, you're going to find those fallacies on, on the, that issue. There's no doubt in my mind. All right, so that's not really hard. This is the, the easier part of the paper. The hard part is going to be you doing both sides because it's very difficult to do the opposite side of somebody's you know, opinion, even though you think, you know, you think you're right, so you only want to look for the things that you're looking for. Now, I'm afraid you guys this year are going to be at a bit of a disadvantage from my, uh, compared to my former students uh, who had to do this paper. Um, you're at an advantage in that you don't have to do it, but you're at a disadvantage if you wanted to do it well, because I didn't actually show you all the um, articles, videos, and stuff that I wanted to. There's a few that we did get through. I'm pretty sure we all saw the EMF one. That was the first one I always show. And the one on breast implants, I'm pretty sure we saw that one. I was the one with the trial lawyers. But the other video, I'm pretty sure we didn't get to see. That was the one on the Gulf War, unless I'm wrong. And uh, we did see the ABC video, uh, Myths, Lies, and Stupidity. Um, and a couple of other John Stossel short videos as well. Um, now, because we didn't get to see all the ones I wanted to show you, you actually don't know all the things that you would want to be able to, like examples of all the things you could have used in this paper. So I want to kind of refresh your memory on the ones we've already seen and on the ones that we didn't see. I'll try to give you a little bit of information too. So the first one you may remember was on EMFs or electromagnetic fields. And that was a big issue 30 years ago or so. Um, we were told about the dangers of mis in that one, we were told about the dangers of misusing epidemiology and how it is at best in an exact science when applied to certain situations. Um, especially, especially, this was the key of that video, in the hands of lay people, people who are not trained. It's easy to misuse epidemiology. It just becomes a correlation. The second video on the controversy over breast implants uh, concentrated on the dangers of the legal system being applied to scientific issues. And finally, the one on the Gulf War Syndrome, which I don't think we ever got to see, uh, concerned the problems that arise when the government gets involved with uh, scientific debates and takes sides. All right, so, uh, it also, by the way, uh, in the John Stossel videos, which we would have seen others that you had gone if, if we had had a long, full year, um, you may remember such topics that we did see on DDT, uh, he did a little bit on global warming, ethanol as a fuel, and nuclear power. You may remember some of those. Those are about only ones we got to see. We would have seen more. Now, just a side note here, I'm sure you're aware, I always try to stay as nonpartisan with these issues as possible. Anytime somebody tries to bring up politics, I usually shut you guys down. Um, and I never ever take sides on a political issue. However, um, some of you may be thinking, well, what about, I heard the word John Stossel. Doesn't he work for Fox? Well, first of all, uh, yes, he uh, did for a while work for Fox, but the stuff I showed you mostly was when he was working for ABC. The other uh, sources of my things, the biggest ones, the three biggest sources were the PBS videos front, from Frontline. Now, no one's going to accuse Frontline of being a conservative hack job. All right, so these guys, I'm not uh, by any means showing you a, uh, a bias, I don't believe that you are showing. If I was showing, if one of them or two of them were biased, then there was always something to counteract that. I've always tried to keep partisan politics out of the classroom, and I hope you will do the same in your papers. No Trump bashing, no Obama hating, no other partisan name calling in your paper. It's a bad way to argue. You'll see that as one of the examples of bad logical fallacies anyway. But on top of that, it has nothing to do with science. Okay, I want you to look at this issue from a scientific issue, a scientific perspective, not from a political perspective. All right, now, throughout all these videos and articles, there are two recurring themes that pop up. The precautionary principle and the law of unintended consequences. Now, I know, even in the short year we had this year, that I discussed both of these things earlier. All right? Anyone who has taken my class in the past 20 years can say that I have discussed those two things. The law of unintended consequences and the precautionary principle. Simply put, the precautionary principle simply means it's better to be safe than sorry. Or to put it another way, if we could prevent just one death by some drastic action, then we need to take that drastic action regardless of the consequences. It's often screamed by, you know, lunatics on the fringes of either side, but what about the children? The Who's thinking of the children? So, there's that. That's the precautionary principle. Better safe than sorry. You know, it, maybe this stuff is causing uh, this uh, breast implants or causing cancer or whatever. We should ban them. Just ban them and, you know, what's the harm? You know, there can't be any harm to that. 
Unfortunately, that's where the law of unintended consequences comes. It goes hand in hand with the precautionary principle because every time you do something to, to um, you have to be careful not that, th that those drastic changes aren't actually causing more harm than they are doing good. I mean, the case in point of that, and I know we got to this one, was DDT. To save the thinning eggshells of uh, raptors, we banned the most effective insecticide the world had ever known. Say, so, so what's wrong with that? You know, it, it saved the uh, bald eagles and, uh, you know, the California condor. Well, the problem is that millions, and that's, this is a number that you can't get your head around. There were 70-some thousand at this point people died of COVID-19, and we consider that a horrible tragedy. Every year... Millions of children die from malaria, which could be prevented by the use of DDT. So, by banning DDT, we you know saved uh, some birds, and maybe we have a cleaner environment. But millions of people die every year, and that's just not like when they first did it. That's every year since then. In undeveloped countries, malaria runs rampant, and uh, people die from it. Not just some, but literally millions. All right. That's probably the most you know dramatic example, but it's not the only one. Um, you know, there's a lot of other ones throughout the year that I would have talked about, and I have talked about. Whenever you take um, action in some way to, to prevent or ameliorate some um, disease or what you see as a toxin, you're going to incur some real risks in that um, uh, in that uh, action. Now, as you make your final arguments in this paper. Okay, I would hope that you're going to use the precautionary principle and a lot of unintended consequences all the time. I mean, it's a very important concept. However, other things should be there too um, that will help you draw your final conclusions, including deceptive statistics, which I'll talk a little bit about um, later on uh, in the next video. Uh, and we covered in a couple of times uh, in some of the previous videos. Lay epidemiology clearly should also be there. All right, you should have... Um, uh, the logical fallacies are the third one. I knew there was one I was forgetting. Logical fallacies, I'm going to give you a video links if you wanted to watch them on. They're kind of cool. It's a very short link, and it's kind of a fun video. And um, that website uh, is right there on the, on the screen that you can see it. Um, and the actual fallacies I will show you on the paper. Uh, I have a handout that actually describes about 18 different fallacies that people use when they're arguing. Okay. Now, one last thing I would share with my classes at the end of the year was a, something it was a handout called the anatomy of a scare story in it i identified the common threads to a lot of the scare stories that we saw throughout the year all right um they're separated into three categories beginning proliferation and defense and again it's on this paper here which you'll all have a copy of i will be going over those in my next video so you'll have to wait with bated breath for that